get away with this at mom I'm going to try with mom and dad. Oh, yeah. I told mom that. I said, all you do is cause her to get more with me. I said, you don't help her. I said, you can't blame her own work. Repented, they were again unified, 
with God and with each other. So if the Lord says to Joshua, so we're in chapter 8, he says to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise home to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourself. So then God gives direction. So this is, he says, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to win this battle. Okay? That's not anything, but I have to be me and Christian, so that's the way. Okay? Just so you know, that's the way. Okay. So Joshua, so God says that you're going to lay an ambush. So Joshua and all the fighting men, so they go up to Ai. So Joshua takes 30,000 men, and they go out by night. So this is, this is what they do. So the 30,000 men, they go behind the city. And then, and then Joshua, Joshua he, he takes, takes a group, group and, and so, so he says, okay, I'm going to go up to the city, to, to the front. And, and then when we get close, they're going to come down and they're going to chase away. So we're just going to pretend that they're chasing us away again like they did last time. So when we're gonna, they're going to follow us and we're going to keep them chasing. But then when there's nobody left in the city because they're all chasing us, the 30,000 men from behind the city are going to go in, they're going to attack and destroy the city. Then Joshua and his men are going to turn on the men that are chasing them, and then they're going to be trapped because they're going to have 30,000 men coming from behind, and then they're going to have Joshua's men coming. So this is the ambush. So now here's the thing. So they attack the city. They burn the entire city, everything in it, except for what God tells them that they can keep. Joshua and the army kill every single soul in the city. Every single soul was killed in the city. No one was spared. God's orders are to annihilate the entire city. Now, when we just kind of read through a scripture, like, right, we can distance ourselves from it. It's just factual. It's just information. But if you let this sink in, okay, this is men, women, pregnant women, babies, children. Kill with swords. Act to death. The king even was taken alive. He was hung on a tree. And the Bible says, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. This is symbolic of this curse that this king was under. At night, they removed his body and they buried it under a huge mound of rocks at the gate of the city, which... I, which is ironic, the same city, he sat at that gate judging everybody else in the city. He himself was judged by God, the gate of the city. Now here's the thing. This is the same issue that we had to deal with with Jericho. Why kill every single person? Why kill every human life? Verse 24, when Israel had finished killing all the inhabitants of Ai in the open wilderness where they pursued them, and all of them to the very last had fallen by the edge of the sword, all Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the edge of the sword. And all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as their plunder according to the word of the Lord that he commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever a heap of ruins as it is to this day. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree till evening, and at sunset Joshua commanded they took his body down, they threw it at the entrance of the gate, and raised over the great heap of stones which stand there to this day. This is a very bloody picture. You know, we want to say, yes, they were victorious. This is bloody. This is bloody. The death and the bloodshed in the Old Testament is commanded by God. This was them being obedient to God. There's other examples of this, okay? 1 Samuel 15, 6. See, Solomon, he lost his kingdom because he disobeyed God and would not kill the Malachites. And so Samuel had to go out and do it for him. And so because of Solomon's disobedience, his kingdom was removed from him. There's other examples all through the Old Testament. 
In order to understand and see this passage in the correct perspective, we have to understand that this text is about God's holiness and his glory. And his concern for his people to be holy. This whole text is about the holiness and the glory of God. God's holiness and his glory is more important than anything else in the entire universe. Including you and including me. In the 19th century, there was a lot of Christians that they tried to get rid of the Old Testament. They said the Old Testament should just be an appendix. Because it's, you know, it's, you know, because it's so bloody. There's just no reason for it to be in the Bible. And then today, there's a whole group. They don't even accept the Old Testament. They call it, they're, they're the New Testament enlightened Christians. But here's the thing with this. Albert Schweitzer said that doing this is the same as throwing out the things that you don't like about God. Because so many want to pick and choose. We want a civilized God. Like our neighbors. Because really, if we're honest, saying because God is holy, God is more holy than human life, his holiness and glory is more important than human life, doesn't feel comfortable, doesn't sound civilized. So just like we we don't take God. I don't want to tame God. I don't want to civilize God. I don't even want a God that I can understand because if I can understand him, he wouldn't be that powerful and he wouldn't be God. So many want to pick and choose what makes them feel comfortable about God, which in the end is just worshiping a God of your imagination. That is not worshiping the God of the Bible. And worshiping a God of your imagination, it's idolatry. It is straight idolatry. God is not civilized like our ideal neighbor next door or a friend. He can't be tamed by our humanistic thinking. He's not safe, but he is the king of the universe, and he is good. He is good. Now, God has sound reasons for why he did this with AI. So 400 years before, God tells Abraham, you will not return for 400 years because the cup of the Amorites is not full. Now, remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Same people, same area, right? God rained down fire on them for their sin. That was a warning to them that if they did not repent and turn from their ways, God was going to bring greater judgment on all of them. It was a warning. See, God was gracious. Instead of looking like, oh, God, you're just so, so mean. No, God was gracious and gave them 400 years to repent. 400 years. They did not repent. They did not turn to God. So in the end, God sends in the people of Israel to bring his judgment on them. So in case you think, well, maybe these Canaanites weren't so bad. They performed child sacrifices. They murdered babies and children. They were depraved, incredibly depraved, sexually and morally. When they were not destroyed, when the children were of Israel were wandering in the desert, they polluted Israel with necromancy, witchcraft, and idol worship. Here's the thing, whenever a people's cup becomes full, judgment will always come. See, this is why we had the blood. The sins of the people, the cup was full. And here's the thing. We like to think, well, the Old Testament is bloody, but not the New Testament. Have they not had revelation? Have they not had revelation? See, one day, Jesus is going to return when the cup of the sins of the entire world is full. And he will judge the world, and it's going to be a whole lot more bloody than this. Way bloodier than any war, any battle, or anything that we've ever seen. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Jesus is clothed in a bloody robe with a sword. The birds are going to come and eat their flesh. That is bloody business. It is bloody. 
So we must not fall into the foolishness of judging God for judging AI. We have no right to judge God. So there are some things that are far more important than human life. You know, God's holiness is more important than my life. God's holiness is more important than your life. God's holiness and God's glory is more important than all of human life and more important than all of creation. God's holiness and glory is more important than all of mankind. See, God is not like us. It's, it's not like he's, we're down here and he's just better than us because he's perfect. He's other than us. Completely other than us. So, so we, we can't, can't take our ideas about God and project them back on God. We can't twist his character to make it more palatable for ourselves or others. Or apologize for his behavior. Then you're shrinking God down to make him like you. And here's the thing. If you you have have a God that agrees agrees with with everything that you say, then you're you're not not worshiping worshiping God, God, you're worshiping yourself. Because you you are the only only person who's going to agree with everything you say. say. So if you're like, oh, God God said that was fine, fine. and oh, he says says that's fine, and he's good with you. Is it really God that's telling you that, though? Right? Right? God is not safe, and he's not civilized in the human sense. His, his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts other my thoughts than your thoughts. See, God is a God that judges, and he will shed human blood. And guess what? He's the creator. He's the owner. He's the boss. And he can do whatever he wants to. And he doesn't have to answer to us. Doesn't matter what we think. He's not up there for us. It's this whole Western culture that they is this whole theology. I'm the center of the universe. No, you're not. God is. They're going to say, like, uh, some people, they're going to be really, really sad when they find out this, find the center of the universe and they realize they're not there. But I think with all of this, we have to ask ourselves, is the cup of Western civilization full? If not, how long before the cup of our country is full? We've talked about this before. Our country is in the state it says, we like to say, it's the homosexual people's fault, it's those people that are, are watching pornography, it's, no, that's the evidence of the judgment that's on our country, because the unthankful parts. See, that's just the evidence that, that's the judgment that God's given us already, because he just turned us over, because we were unthankful. We didn't acknowledge him as God. We sat in our our, our, our little, little Bible, Bible bubbles in churches, churches and wouldn't let like anybody in if they didn't, they didn't talk, talk like us and look like us. Yeah. Our, all, all, all of us, we, we all, all have, have to look in the mirror and take responsibility for the judgment on our country. Now, God is especially concerned that his people understand the reason behind the burning rubble of death. So imagine, the day before they just killed Achan and his whole entire family, now today, there's this entire burning city of rubble. And so God, this is a per- God is visual, and God paints pictures for us. So God uses this opportunity in verse 30. He has Joshua build an altar. This is 13 miles from Ai, and it's in this valley, uh, it's in the valley of Shechem, it's between Ebal and Gerizim. So this is the valley of Shechem, so on the right is Mount Ebal, and on the left is Mount Gerizim. So it's kind of like a, uh, a natural amphitheater, sound carried very well. So they made an altar of uncut stones because God does not dwell in the temple from human hands. They were not to cut the stones. The people were not to engage in idolatry. So then they, they had a, it's, uh, so the altar, so they burned the fat, but then they ate the actual meat. So it was a, it was a communion meal with God. 
It was symbolic of sharing a meal with God. And then in verse 32, Joshua wrote on the stones a copy of the law. When Moses was in the desert, he told the people, when you get here, write the law on these large stones. So they're doing what Moses told them in Deuteronomy 27. So they plastered the stones. This is actually an Egyptian technique that they learned in Egypt. And then the red paint, they use the red paint to write the law. Now, in this, it may have been the commandments with the blessings and the curses at the end of Deuteronomy. This is the first time that the law is actually written outside of the Ten Commandments that were written on the stone that are inside the Ark of the Covenant. So this is a public proclamation of everybody that enters into Israel, because see, this is the, the entrance to the Promised Land, that... God sets the standard here. We live according to the authority of God's word and God's law. So all excuse for error is removed because it's written right there for all to see. There is no excuse. And here's the other thing. The people are no longer completely dependent on Moses or Joshua anymore because the law is right there for them to read for themselves. Because you shouldn't be dependent upon anyone to teach you what the Bible says. You have God's word in your own hands every single day. You need to read it for yourself. Don't come here and depend on me to tell you what Joshua is saying, right? Don't, don't come here and depend on Brother Terry to tell you. Don't sit at home watching, you know, whatever evangelist on television week after week and depend on them. You pick your Bible up and read it for yourself. Because people are wrong. People have different views of doctrine. If you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. He promises to teach you. So if you say, well, I can't understand it, it's too complicated, well, you need to take that up with God. He will help you understand it. Ask him to help you, okay? And here's the other thing is, this passage is about not just knowing the word of God, but obeying the word of God. You can't obey it if you never open it up and if you don't know what it says. So now all of Israel, they're divided into two groups. So imagine this. You have a half a million on one side, on one mountain. You have another half a million on the other. And in the valley between the stone monoliths is the ark and the entire tribe of Levi in the center. Now this, 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 there's this chant led by Joshua, and he begins with the curses. And after he lists the curse, says a curse, then the people on Mount Ebal chant, Amen. I mean, can you imagine the roar of the sound of the people and then the backdrop to what had already happened when they sinned? How seriously God takes it? And then he read another, and then he reads on the other side, he reads the blessings. So the tribes on the side of Gerizim, they say amen to the blessings. So here we have God's people themselves are calling down blessings and cursing on themselves depending upon whether they will obey or disobey God's law. They are acknowledging that they know it and they are in agreement and they are subjecting themselves to the authority of God and his word. This is the, this is the authority of God's word demonstrated here. And here we, again, we see this theme that we saw through all the other passages of Joshua, central to the people and the tribe and their lives and their community. The very center of it is the presence of God in the ark and then the word of God with the law. The presence and the word of God is central to community. So the entire community is under the obligation but also receives the beneficiary of God's covenant, including mourners. So this shows all who are willing to repent are welcome into God's covenant people. So people in churches, us today, we are under the obligation to obey God's word. We don't have an excuse. There are so many versions of the Bible, translations of the Bible. It's so easy to get your hands on a Bible. 
Pick up your cell phone and the Bible's right there. We have no excuse. The sad thing, we probably have more Bibles in our entire nation than any other country and probably one of the most morally bankrupt nations. So clearly having access to the Word of God has no bearing on how Christian a nation really is. Knowledge, it's evidence that knowledge is not good enough. It's a heart. It's a heart issue. The other thing is we see that the community is unified by their allegiance to God and His Word. Their community is not based on political affiliation or political ties, but a common commitment to the Lord Himself. Now, just as we can't cherry pick what attributes of God that we're comfortable with, we don't get to cherry pick parts of God's Word that we like better than others. Like, well, that that makes me feel good, good, but I'm not comfortable with that, so let me make some excuses why I don't need to do that. I don't like that. So let me ask you, what would happen if you have instructions for assembling and calibrating a helicopter instrument panel? Okay? You have to use this really complicated equipment, and you've got to perform a very complicated order of tasks. But you decide, you get to step three and think, Well, there's no point in that. I mean, that's just silly because I'm doing this and this. And then this and this is step four and five. That doesn't really seem necessary. That doesn't make any sense. I'll just skip that. So because you left out a seemingly unnecessary step, the instrument panel is lacking a key operation. And you might not notice it right away. Everything might. All the lights come on and flash and ding. Everything looks perfect. So you didn't really need that stuff. But here's the thing. Lives are endangered because of it. So disobeying God is like saying, God, I know better than me how to live my life. Every time you and I disobey God, we are telling God that we know better than he does. And just like we're picking and choosing his attributes, like we want to team God and civilize God, which is idolatry, when we disobey God, we're doing the same thing. We're doing the same thing. It's wrong. It's not good. But the beautiful thing is, is God in his grace, in his compassion, he's given us his word, his reading. If we did not have the Bible, it would be very challenging and difficult to know the character of God. Like, we can see some things from creation, right? But we have an entire scripture, Old and New Testament, filled with the grace of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, all these amazing, beautiful things about God. And knowing that we can trust him with our future, too, because of what he's done in the past. God has chosen in his grace and mercy to reveal himself to us through his word. Everything we need to know about God, it's all in Scripture. You don't need to go run to somebody else to find out about God. You don't need to run to find somebody else and have somebody else tell you what God's will for your life is. They don't need to tell you. And if they're so busy telling you, they need to worry about themselves. I know God's will for themselves. You want to know who God is? You want to know his character, you're in trouble, you, 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 you need help, you need comfort, you need sustenance, it's all in God's word. He will meet you there because it is living and it is breathing and it is the authority for our lives. And it's God and his word that unites all of us together is his people, is his people. And I know this is a little bit off subject, but I'm going to go there. We are voting, right, this week. And here's the thing, and I heard this week, and I'm going to pass it on to you because I just decided I'm doing it out here. I promise you there's probably somebody else in here that is going to vote completely different than you do. But here's the thing, so what? Who cares? That's not the point. The point is 
We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are unified with God. And what matters is not what political party people are. What matters is do we have a relationship with God? Is he the authority over our lives? Are we unified with him? That's all we need to worry about. It's just him. It's his word. Are we unified under the word of God? Is he paramount? Do we give him full authority in our lives and in our hearts? So instead of worrying about what other people are voting and doing, let's just all worry about ourselves. Like Sherry goes, you need to stop talking about other folks and talking about yourself. So let's not worry about other folks. Let's worry about ourselves and our own hearts. Okay? All right. So let me close this prayer. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you that you... You, you have, have given, given us just such a beautiful, beautiful thing, thing um, with being united, united with brothers and sisters who come alongside of us, who encourage us, who, who, who lift us up, Lord. And we're just so thankful. I'm so thankful for each, each, each individual here that you have placed in my life. And Lord, I pray as we go about the morning, I pray that we would worship and honor and praise you through our, our time of worship. I pray that we... We would set aside our, our, our individual thoughts and thinking, Lord, that we would just praise and honor you and give you the glory that is due you by singing and praise to you and you alone. And Lord, I just pray for the rest of our service this morning. I pray that our hearts would be united in, uh, in you, Lord, because we know that if our hearts are united with you, that we'll be united with one another. And I just praise you and I thank you for all of these people and for your word and for your presence and your power. In Jesus' name. Amen.